Comparing proportions is of interest for studies in which the outcome is categorical and there are two or more groups. We will focus on the simplest situation where the outcome is binary. For example, dead or alive, disease progressed, did not progress, and two groups are being compared. For example, exposed, not exposed, treatment versus control. This lecture focuses on comparing proportions from prospective studies, such as cohort studies, in which the two groups of interest are typically those exposed and those not exposed to some risk factor, or clinical trials in which the two groups of interest are participants who received a new treatment and participants who served as controls. The material for this lecture was developed by Ian Beerley and Laura Lay at the University of Minnesota's Department of Biostatistics. I am presenting this lecture with their permission. Have you heard the saying, an aspirin a day keeps heart attacks away? A key study that helped to support this claim was the Physician's Health Study, which was a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial that began in the 1980s. The researchers in this study recruited male physicians in the U.S. aged 40 to 84 years old. Of those who were contacted, 22,071 physicians volunteered and were eligible to participate. The men were randomly assigned to one of two groups, daily low-dose aspirin, aspirin pill group or daily placebo pill group, and were monitored for cardiovascular endpoints. In particular, the primary outcome of interest for this study was first heart attack. After five years, 139 of the 11,037 men in the aspirin group experienced a heart attack, while 239 of the 11,034 men in the placebo group experienced a heart attack. Translating these values into a proportion, 0.013 of the men in the aspirin group, aspirin group and 0.022 in the placebo group had had a heart attack. Based on this, we can see that the proportion we can see that the proportion of heart attacks is higher in the placebo group than the aspirin group. How might we obtain a single quantity to compare these two groups? And could this could this large of a difference be the result of sampling variability or is this evidence of a difference? Let's use statistical methods to answer these questions. When we have two binary categorical variables, we can display the counts for each combination of categories in a 2x2 two two contingency table. The recommended way to display the 2x2 two two table is to have the two groups that are being compared in the rows and the outcome of interest in the columns with the event of interest in the first column. The sample size for group 1 and group 2 are denoted as n sub 1 and n sub 2 in the table, the last column in the table and these add up to the total sample size n for the entire study. We denote the counts in the middle of the table as a for those in group 1 who had the event of interest, b for those in group 1 who did not have the event of interest, c for those in group 2 who had the event of interest, and finally d for those in group 2 who did not have the event of interest. It is very important to set your table up with the rows and columns in this order presented on this slide. If you mix up the rows and columns, then you're mixing up A, B, C, and D, and the formulas as presented in this lecture will not be correct. One summary measure of interest might be calculating the proportion who had the event in each of the groups. The proportion who had the event in group 1 is A divided by the total in group 1, N sub 1. Similarly, for group 2, the proportion who had the event in group 2 is C divided by the total in group 2, n sub 2. Because these proportions are from a sample, we label them p hat 1 and p hat 2, and they are point estimates of the population proportions p sub 1 and p sub 2. There is another term for these proportions, risk. The estimated risk of having an event is another name for the proportion with the event in a prospective study. The risk terminology can only be used in prospective studies such as cohort studies or clinical trials, in which participants are followed over time, since it expresses the number who experience the outcome as a proportion of all those who were at risk at the start of the study. In epidemiologic usage, a person is at risk of an outcome if they are capable of having it and two, they haven't had it yet.
a person is at risk of lung cancer if they have a lung and don't have lung cancer already. A person is at risk of death if they are alive. Note that this usage of phrase at risk differs substantially from the colloquial usage you are likely to see in newspapers or public policy reports. Once we have the risk estimates for each group, how might we create a single quantity to compare the risks in the two groups? Popular comparative measures are differences, subtraction, and ratios, division. The former is used to make absolute comparisons, for example, 10% higher, and the latter is used to make relative comparisons, for example, two times more. When comparing proportions or risks using subtraction, the difference between the two proportions or risks is called a risk difference. It is also sometimes called the attributable risk. The risk difference is defined as the value of the risk of the event in group one, P sub hat sub one, minus the risk of the event in group two, P sub hat sub two. In most cases, group one is the group of interest and group two is the reference or control group. If the group of interest has the higher risk, then the risk difference will be a positive value. Whereas if the group of interest has the lower risk, then the risk difference will be a negative value. If we compared proportions or risks using division, the ratio between two proportions or risks is called a relative risk. The relative risk is defined as the risk of the event in group one, p hat one, divided by the risk of the event in group two, p hat sub two. Similar to risk difference, group one is the group of interest and group two is the reference or control group. If the group of interest has the higher risk, then the relative risk will be a value greater than one. Whereas if the group of interest has the lower risk, then the relative risk will be a value less than one. An alternative way of interpreting this ratio is to translate this value into a percent. If the relative risk is less than one, we translate this into a percent decrease, since the risk is less in the group of interest than in the reference group. We do this by taking one minus the relative risk and then multiplying that number by 100. If the relative risk is greater than one, we translate this into a percent increase since the risk is more in the group of interest than in the reference group. We do this by taking the relative risk minus one and taking the product of that uh, and then multiplying that by 100. The data from the physician's health study are shown here again. The risks of heart attack are for both groups were presented in an earlier slide, but now the complete details of the calculations are shown. The risk of having a heart attack for those in the, average, in the aspirin group was 139 divided by 11,037, which equals 0 0.013. The risk of having a heart attack for those in the placebo group was 239 divided by 11,034 which equals 0 0.022. The risk difference, the difference in proportions, for this example is 0 0.013 minus 0 0.022, which is negative 0 0.009. This means that the absolute risk of having a heart attack is 0 0.009 lower in the aspirin group as compared to the placebo group. The relative risk is 0 0.013 divided by 0 0.022, which is 0 0.581. This means that those who took aspirin had 0 0.581 times the risk of having a heart attack compared to those who took the placebo. An alternative interpretation, since the relative risk was less than one in the physician's health study, can be found by calculating the percent reduction in risk as one minus 0.581 and taking that value and multiplying it by 100, which equals 41.9%. This means those who took aspirin had a 41.9% reduction in risk of heart attack compared to those who took placebo. We know that if we repeated this study, the estimated risk values in each group would be slightly different due to sampling variability. Let's use statistical inference, specifically interval estimation, 
on these summary measures to understand if what we observed is due to sampling variability or if there is a evidence of a real difference. Earlier this semester, we learned about how to use the bootstrap to estimate the confidence interval for a difference in proportions. Unsurprisingly, however, this can be calculated directly using a formula. Recall that the general formula for a confidence interval is the point estimate plus or minus the margin of error. Filling in these details for estimating a difference of two population proportions, or risks, the point estimate is the difference between the two sample proportions, or risks, that is, the risk difference. The confidence interval is the point estimate plus or minus the degree of confidence, which is the appropriate z value, times the estimated standard error for the difference in the sample proportions, or risks. The estimated standard error is the square root of the sample proportion in group 1 times 1 minus the sample proportion in group 1 all over the sample size for group 1 plus the sample proportion in group 2 times 1 minus the sample proportion in group 2 all over the sample size for group 2. The confidence interval formula presented on the slide only applies when all of the assumptions are met for comparing two proportions. These assumptions will be presented in an upcoming slide. Remember to check the assumptions first before carrying out any inferential method. Recall that the values in a confidence interval provide plausible values for the true population parameter. But we can only use it to make conclusions about signif statistical significance. How might we do this for risk difference? When using comparison measures, it's good to ask yourself if the two groups were equal, the null hypothesis were true, what value would result using this comparison measure? This we'll call the null value. In the case of a risk difference, if the two groups were equal and we took the difference between them, then the null value would be zero. Using similar logic to what was presented in a previous lecture, if the null value does not fall within the confidence interval, then this value is not plausible and therefore we would have evidence that the true population value is different than the null value. That is, the results are statistically significant and there is evidence of a difference in proportions between the two groups. This situation is shown in the first line above. The confidence interval does not include the null value, in this case, zero. Conversely, if the null value falls within the confidence interval limits, then it is a plausible value one of many different plausible values, and we would not have enough evidence to say the true population value is different than the null value. That is, the results are not statistically significant, and there is not enough evidence of a difference in proportions between the two groups. This situation is shown in the second line below, which is uh, colored red. The confidence interval does include the null value of zero, which you can tell by it overlapping with the vertical line coming out of zero. Now let's calculate the confidence interval for the risk difference for the physician's health study example. The sample risk difference of having a heart attack between the aspirin and control groups is negative 0.009, and the estimated standard error for the difference is 0.002. The z-value for a 95% confidence interval is the value in the standard normal distribution with 0.975 of the area lying below that value. So the z-value is 1.96. This value can be found using StatKey, Wolfram Alpha, or elsewhere. Putting all of these values together, the point estimate, the z-value, and the standard error, a 95% confidence interval for the difference in the population risk of having a heart attack between the aspirin and control groups is between negative 0.011 and negative 0.007. We are 95% confident that the true difference in risk of heart attack between the aspirin and control groups is between negative 0.011 and negative 0.007. Or we could say a range of plausible values for the true difference in risk of heart attack between the aspirin and control groups is from negative 0.011 to negative 0.007. Because the 95% confidence interval does not include zero, then zero is not a plausible value, 
and we can conclude that the difference in risk of heart attack between the aspirin and control groups is statistically significant. There is evidence of a difference in risk of heart attack between the two groups, with aspirin having between 0.007 to 0.011 or 0.7% to 1.1% lower risk than the placebo group. Unlike the usual calculation for a confidence interval as presented for risk difference, computing a confidence interval for relative risk is a two-step procedure. We see that the first step looks very similar to the general formula for a confidence interval. It's going to be our point estimate plus or minus the margin of error, but it has the natural log of the relative risk. This is because the sampling distribution for relative risk does not follow a normal distribution, no matter what the sample size is. But if we take the natural log of the sample relative risk, then the sampling distribution for this transformed measure is approximately normal. Applying this transformation allows us to use normal-based methods for calculating the confidence interval. So step one is to calculate the confidence interval for the natural log of the relative risk where the point estimate is the natural log of the sample relative risk. The degree of confidence is the appropriate Z value. And the estimated standard error of the natural log of relative risk is as shown on the slide. Then step two is to back transform the confidence interval values found for the natural log of relative risk by taking the anti-log, the exponential function. This will produce the lower and upper limits of the confidence interval for relative risk on the original slide. The confidence interval formula presented on this slide only applies when all of the assumptions are met for comparing two proportions. These assumptions will be presented in an upcoming slide. Remember to check the assumptions first before carrying out any inferential method. Similar to the approach used for relative risk, let's figure out how we can make conclusions about statistical significance using relative risk. Let's ask the same question again. If the two groups were equal, the null hypothesis were true, what value would result, what value would result using this comparison measure, the null value? If the two groups were equal and we took the ratio between them, then the null value would be one. So if the null value does not fall within the confidence interval limits, then this value is not plausible, and therefore we would have evidence that the true population value is different than the null value. This situation is shown in the blue line, in the first blue line above. The confidence interval does not include the null value of one. Conversely, if the null value falls within the confidence interval limits, then it is a plausible value, one of many different plausible values, and we would not have enough evidence to say the true population value is different than the null value. This situation is shown in the second line above. The confidence interval does include the null value of one because we can see that it overlaps with the vertical line coming out of one. Now let's calculate the confidence interval for the relative risk for the at physician's health study example. The sample relative risk of having a heart attack between the aspirin and con control groups is 0.581. Taking the natural log of this value gives us negative 0.542 and the estimated standard error for the natural log of the relative risk is 0.106. The Z value for a 95% confidence interval is the value in the standard normal distribution with 0.975 of the area lying below that value, so the Z value is again 1.96. Putting all these values together, the point estimate, the Z value, and the standard error, a 95% confidence interval for the natural log of the relative risks is between negative 0 0.750 and negative 0.335. Next, we need to exponentiate those limits to get the 95% confidence interval for the relative risk. Exponentiating negative 0 0.750 equals 0.473 and exponentiating negative 0.335 equals 0.715. We can interpret, it, interpret this as follows. We are 95% confident that the relative risk of heart attack between the aspirin and control groups is between 0.473 and 
or we could say a range of plausible values for the true relative risk of heart attack between the aspirin and control groups is from 0.473 to 0.715. Because the 95% confidence interval does not include one, then one is not a plausible value, and we can conclude that the relative risk of, of heart attack between the aspirin and control groups is statistically significant. There is evidence of a difference in risk of heart attack between the two groups, with aspirin having between 0.473 to 0.715 times the risk of the placebo group, or 28.5% to 52.7% reduction in risk. Now, what are the assumptions? First, the samples should be random or representative samples from the respective populations to allow us to generalize the results to those populations. Second, the observations within each group should be independent of one another, and the observations in one group should be independent of the observations in the other group. Third, we assume that the sample is large enough for the sampling distribution of risk difference or the sampling distribution of the natural log of the relative risk to be approximately normal. For these statistics, large enough requires the counts in the middle of the 2x2 table, A, B, C, and D, to be at least 5. In our example, this assumption would be met if our sample size contained at least 5 people in each of the cells in the table. If the sample size is too small, other methods, such as bootstrapping, should be used to compute confidence interval. If these assumptions are violated, the confidence intervals we calculate may give us faulty information about the true population parameters. Both the relative risk and the risk difference summarize the 2x2 two two table data using a single number. However, neither the risk difference nor the relative risk gives a complete picture of the impact of an exposure or proposed treatment. Reporting only the relative risk can be misleading. Reducing the risk of disease by 50% sounds impressive, but if the disease is rare, then such a reduction may have little practical impact. To see why, considering the following situation. Suppose we have developed a vaccine that halves the risk of a particular disease, so the risk of the disease in the vaccinated is half that in the unvaccinated. The relative risk equals 0 0.50. What impact will our new vaccine have? Refer to the left side of this slide above. In case one, the disease is quite rare. The risk of disease in the unvaccinated is only two in 10 million. Our new vaccine cuts the risk in half, so the risk of the disease in the vaccinated is one in 10 million. The risk difference, therefore, is one in 10 million. In case two, the disease is more common. The risk of disease in the unvaccinated is two in 10 or 20%. Our new vaccine cuts the risk in half, so the risk of disease in the vaccinated is 10%. The risk difference, therefore, is 10%. Our new vaccine would have much more impact in case two, where the prevalence of the disease is high, than in case one, where the disease is rare, even though the relative risk is the same. On the other hand, reporting only the risk difference can also be misleading. Let's consider an environmental contaminant where the exposed people have a 1% higher risk than the unexposed people refer to the left side of this slide. In case one, the risk of the disease in unexposed people is fairly low at 1%, so the contaminant raises the risk to 2%. The contaminant doubles the number of people who can be expected to acquire the disease, though the relative risk therefore is 2.0. In case two, the risk of the disease in unexposed people is already quite high at 89%. Think common cold so the contaminant raises the risk to 90%. The contaminant increases by only 1% the number of people who can be expected to acquire the disease. So the relative risk is 1.01. The contaminant in case one is likely to raise more concern since it doubles the risk, even though the absolute number of people harmed is the same in both cases. It is important to keep the difference between risk difference and the relative risk in mind when reading the news and research. Researchers have a tendency to report their results in whichever way makes them sound more impressive. For example, reporting benefits with big numbers, for example, relative risk, and harms with small numbers, for example, risk difference. This is misleading. A famous researcher who studies how people understand risk, Gerd Gergen, Gergenenzer, 
suggests that researchers report absolute measures over relative measures because it's easier to understand them. The key point is that the impact of an exposure or treatment depends on how common the condition or disease is in the first place.